you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them and turn with me to Psalm 63. Psalm 63. And as you are turning, I'm going to go ahead and ask uh, one last time. I'm going to ask our kids, the little kids, not the big kids. Um, first of all, if, if you can tell me what the name Psalm means. All right, now like, I'll accept two different answers. All right, Lincoln, praises, that's right. That's what one of them, you can come pick out a prize if you want. So psalm means praises, and then there's another meaning. Anybody remember what the other meaning is? Hold on, Norm. If they don't get it, I'll give it to them. I'll give it to you. That's all right. I'll pick them up. You take your pick. Quinn. Songs on stringed instruments. All right, good job. She remembers. Sorry, you missed out. All right, I'm running out. That's what your brother took. Okay, Psalm 63. So I'm I'm going to ask a few more questions, but uh, you'll just have to listen up and follow along. We'll see who gets the answers. All right. So Psalm 63. I'm going to start. Just reading briefly, uh, so pay close attention, all right? Psalm 63, a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. We're going to stop there and have a word of prayer, and then we'll kind of dig into this together a little bit. Father, I want to give you thanks tonight for your word. Lord, we need it. I need to hear it. Lord, particularly as we come to this uh, beautiful passage of Scripture, we are reminded how desperately we need you. And I pray that you would just speak to our hearts right where we're at, that you would comfort, that you would strengthen, that you would convict and rebuke, Lord, where it's needed. Help me, Father, to proclaim your word in spirit and truth in a way that brings honor and glory to your name and exalts the name of Jesus. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord, and amen. All right, so who wrote Psalm 63? Brian? Brian? David. All right. Good job, buddy. Oh, all right. So, David, I'm going to ask one more question later on. So you got to listen up. OK, but Psalm 63, David wrote the psalm and we're actually told where he was when he wrote this psalm. So we get some insight into the background. It says he was in the wilderness of Judah. Now, we know this, David was no stranger to the wilderness. I mean, this is a, a man, we, you know, Steve shared a few weeks ago from Psalm 57, he was hiding out in a cave, running for his life from King Saul. David knows what it's like to be in the wilderness. Uh, it, was not, it was not during this time in his life, however, uh, that Psalm 63 was written. Right? It wasn't early on, but while he was waiting to be king, when Saul was chasing him in the wilderness. We, we know that primarily from later on, uh, in fact, verse 11 says, the king shall rejoice in God. And he's talking about himself here. So this is a time when David was king. So at this point in his life, when he is reigning and ruling over, uh, over God's kingdom, right, there's a portion where he ends up again out in the wilderness. And at this point, his own son, Absalom, has tried to take the throne And David has had to flee Jerusalem and go out into the wilderness. And so if you can just imagine what David is going through, what he's experiencing, not only has he he, been removed from his throne and, and removed from the palace and he's running for his life, but it's his own son that is chasing him down. So you can imagine how he's, the emotions that he's feeling in, in this moment, um, in, in the wilderness, I know when we think of wilderness, we think of mountains and 
you know, we think of just a range of trees and, and, and flowing streams, but a wilderness, the way that David would have been describing, is a, a desert place, right? So it's not, not mountains and streams and trees, right? It's empty, dry, deserted, and so as David goes out into the wilderness, he's going to have, he's going to be longing for food, he's going to be longing for water, there's no shade from the heat of the day, and this is where he's at physically. So you can imagine, you know, the physical drain that that's going to have on him. But as, as much as the, all of this is taking place physically in his circumstances, what we find from Psalm 63 is David is not primarily concerned about his physical being. I mean, his life is on the line, and his concern is his soul. His concern is his spiritual being. When you look there at, at, at I think it's, it's verse 1, he says, um, earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you. You, you get the picture here? He's, he's saying, yeah, my, my flesh may be hungry, my flesh may be thirsty, but what I really want is you. What I really want is you, Lord. I'm thirsting for you. I'm longing for you. And I think there's a sense in which David is remembering what it's like, I mean, what is in Jerusalem? It's the, it's the temple, right? It's where the worship of God takes place. It's where he gathers together with the people of God. And so there's a sense in which he's missing and longing for the worship of God in the temple. Uh, and, and, and he's just, you have to imagine he feels abandoned, alone, betrayed. And I wonder tonight, if you've ever been there. I know many of you are nodding along, right? You've, you've experienced what it's like to be betrayed, to be abused, to be abandoned, to feel alone. You know, what, what is your wilderness? And understand, right, we're talking about a very real circumstance, physical circumstances, David's life. But you may be in a similar situation where you Circumstances of life are such that it is just, it's awful, brutal, terrible. However, life itself can be really good and things can be going well and you can still, still spiritually feel like you're in a wilderness. Spiritually speaking, things can be great in life and yet you can feel distant from God. Longing, craving for him. I, I, think it's, I think it's natural, isn't it, at times for us as Christians to feel a dryness. We have seasons of life where we are refreshed and we are revived and we are renewed and we feel close to the Lord, closer than we've ever felt at times. And then there are seasons where we feel distant and far and it just feels like, what, what's going on in my life right now? Why am, you know, and you see other people who are on fire and they're hot for God and you're going, why is my heart not like that? Why am I not fulfilled and satisfied in God like that? You ever feel that way? Yeah. And as, as we see David's heart here, this is what we find, right? <laughs> He's in the wilderness and yet his heart is only looking to God. I mean, in those moments when the trials and storms of life come along, you can absolutely say, God let me down. God abandoned me. He failed me. But David doesn't say God failed me. He says, God, you're all I want. You're all I need right now. So, so what do you do when you're in the wilderness? I mean, David could do lots of things, right? He could, he could dwell on his circumstances. He could be thinking, man, if I was back in the palace, I'd be enjoying this great meal and my servants would be bringing me this feast. And or he could be thinking about his son Absalom right now. Absalom, Absalom, my son. He'll later cry out. Right? I mean, David's family is a mess. He could, he could only be thinking about those things. But... Notice where he's at here. And, and here's what I would say. Right? We're going to look at a few things. I got six. We'll see if we can get through them. All right? From Psalm 63. 
What do you do when you're in the wilderness? Number one, we see here in verses one and two, you need to seek God. You need to seek God with all that you are. David says, oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. He says, this is a psalm that has been used in church history uh, for centuries. Uh, It was the early church father Chrysostom who said, there's not a day that goes by that the people of God should not sing Psalm 63. Uh, It was known as a morning hymn. Uh, Now, the reason it was known as a morning hymn is what we find here in the first verse where we read in the RESV, it says, earnestly I seek you. The KJV says, early will I seek you. Early will I seek you. Not a contradiction at all, right? The word is tied closely to the dawn, but it just has the idea of priority, right? We're, you know, putting God first. So he's saying the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to seek after God. So a morning hymn that we find. Now, last question, right? See if my kids were paying attention. All right, so what was this psalm known as? When do they usually sing it? Anybody? One of our kids. I know, I talked for a long time, then I wanted you to remember. Avonlea? In the morning, a morning hymn. Girl, that's impressive. You can have, you can have both of them. All right. So, we see what David's is doing here is he is seeking after God, right? He's making it a priority in his time of trial. In his, <laughs> this, is, this is about as bad as it gets. He's alone, he's abandoned, he's betrayed by his own son. And he says, oh God, you are my God. I think it's important to note here right off the bat, This is not the seeking and thirsting of someone who is looking for God. This is is not someone who's saying, God, if you're there, make yourself know. This is someone who's saying, God, you are my God. This is someone who knows God, and yet he's seeking him. Yet he's thirsting after him. How, How do you explain that? He knows God. He has God. Well, what David wants in this moment is more, more of God, right? Lord, I know you, but I want to know you more, right? This is, this is the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3, right? This is exactly what he says, right? To the surpassing worth of the, of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord. But he says, I want to know you in the power of your resurrection. He knows God. He knows Christ, but he says, I want to know you in a deeper way, a fuller way. And so if you're in a dry and thirsty place, if you're if you're in a wilderness experience spiritually, the first thing I would say is you need to seek after God. And the language here is so important. He says, God, you are my God. This is essential. (laughs) You have to have an actual personal relationship with God. (laughs) And and so this is what David is saying here, right? In his desperation, I look to you alone. Is he your God? Some people might wonder, well, can I really know God like that in a personal way, in an experiential way? And I would say this, not only can you know God like that, you must know God like that. If, if you don't know God in, a, in an experiential, relational way, then you are lost. This is, Jesus said, this is eternal life. To know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. You know, John 17, 3. This is, this is essential for life. And so David here, he knows God in this personal way. But he wants more. 
God, you are my God. What's he doing in this moment? He's affirming that relationship, and he's affirming his trust in him. Let me ask you, do you know God? Do you love God? Do you desire to know God in a deeper way? Is there, is there a longing in your heart to grow deeper with him? That should be the experience of every single follower of Christ. Yes, I know you. But we're not talking about just this, yes, I've, I've grabbed a hold of my salvation ticket. We're talking about a real relationship. We are worshiping an infinite God. The God of the universe. And there's no end to him. And we can never come to the end of him. And so we should constantly be seeking to know him deeper and more fully. And that's what David is saying here. And it's not just personal. It's very practical. As he says, oh God, you are my God. Right? This is Elohim, the God of all power. And David's just acknowledging, God, you have power to meet my needs. He's saying you are the only source of help. You are my only source of hope. Where could I go but to the Lord? And that's where David cries out in this moment in the wilderness. So yes, when in those moments where you feel dry and thirsty, seek him. Seek him. In fact, that's the language that we find here, right? It's, it's this personal, powerful God that David longs for. He says, earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. That's intense. Right? In this desert place, when, when, in a place where he would have been so physically thirsty, he's equating that to his spiritual desire to know God, to experience God. Have you ever been really thirsty? I know you have at times. <laughs> I had a run a few weeks ago. I went out and didn't have any water, and it was a pretty long run, and about halfway in, I'm like, man, I need something to drink. And I just looked every, there's no water fountains, there's no, any, I'm, I have to finish this run and get home and get something to drink. I was parched. I couldn't wait to get something to drink. I would have done anything to get something to drink. I looked everywhere. That kind of craving, that kind of desire, when you're so thirsty, is the very craving that David's expressing here for God. The prophet Jeremiah says, I will seek, or you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all of your heart. So how do we seek after God? We seek him with everything we are. Right? That's, that's the picture that we have here. He says, my soul and my flesh, all that I am, wants all of you, Lord. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David's saying, I'm in this place where there's no satisfaction. I'm in this place where there's nothing that will quench my thirst. Now that's true, brothers and sisters of the world we live in, is it not? We live in a dry and thirsty land where there is no water. We live in a world that will constantly offer up opportunities to quench your thirst, but it will always leave you wanting. Always. Some of you here, you're here tonight, and you're in this thirsty place, and you are drinking from the wrong well. You're trying to quench your thirst. You're, cry, you're trying to quench your desire in the things of this world, and it's always going to leave you thirsty for more. Always. Money, sex, power, right? Material possessions, popularity. The list just goes on and on. You can pull yourself into your job and you can try and reach the American dream and constantly some. this will fill your desire. This will quench your thirst. And it never, ever does. This is what the people of God were guilty of in Jeremiah chapter 2. Jeremiah 2.13, it says, For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They turn away from God, and they turn to other things. When you're dry and thirsty, perhaps that's the problem. There's something, someone in your life that has taken the rightful place of God, and you need to seek after Him. 
This is experiential language here, right? It, we, you know, think, think, of, um, think of Jesus' encounter with the woman at the well. He, he encounters this woman who, Jesus is physically thirsty, but she is spiritually parched. And he says to her, what? I will give you living water so that you will never thirst again. Right? The water that Jesus gives is meant to be taken in and satisfy our thirsty souls. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink in John 7, 37. If anyone thirsts, are you thirsty tonight spiritually? Come to him. Um, Psalm 34, 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Do you hear the language there? This is the way in which we are to experience God. We are to the language is, let, take him in, taste, drink, and see. I think, of, I think of Job. Job going through that terrible trial. At the end, at the end of Job, in, in chapter 42 and verse 5, Job says, I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Now, now I know now I see, right? Seeing and tasting and thir- or, you know, drinking. Those are, God is meant to be experienced. He's meant to be felt. This is more than just an intellectual knowledge. Sometimes we shy away from feelings. We shy away from emotions. The psalmist, doesn't, they don't allow us to do that, do they? No, God is meant to be experienced. And that's what we see here. So let me ask you this. Where did David develop this thirst for the Lord? Well, we see it in verse 2. He says, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and your glory. I, I, I really think David's thirst was birthed in the place of corporate worship. As he gathered with the people of God and he experienced, he says, the power and glory of God. Did, did David actually see God in the temple? I mean, did he have this Isaiah experience? No, he didn't have that. What's he, what's he saying here? What does he mean? He means that when the people of God gathered together corporately, God made his presence known in a particular way, a powerful way, that God's glory was evident. This is exactly what should be true of us as we gather together, is it not? As we gather together, God makes his self known, his presence known. And here's what I know. Many times when you're in the wilderness and your soul is spiritually thirsty, what you want to do is avoid other people. That's what you want to do. You you do not want to come to church. You do not want to be around other believers. You want to avoid that. You want to stay away. And can I just say to you pastorally, Don't do that. Don't isolate yourself from the people of God. Don't hide yourself away. You're only going to make things worse. David here is saying, this is what I miss. This is what I need. I I remember what it was like to look upon you in the sanctuary. If you're going to find help and you're going to quench your thirst, then get into the house of God. Gather with the people of God. We need that. We need that. And so... How do we develop this, right? How do we, what do we do in the wilderness? So we seek after God. And the second thing we see here in verses 3 and 4, we need to thank God. <laughs> say, thank God? That seems like a strange thing to say. He's, he's abandoned. He's alone, <laughs> betrayed. But notice what he says. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands do you hear and this is this is incredible language god your love is better than life do you, do you notice here in this psalm he never asks for anything he doesn't ask god to restore him to the palace he doesn't ask him to deal with his son absalom he doesn't ask for anything he just says god i want you i want you more than anything else your Love is better than life itself. I've experienced your love, God, and I want more of that. 
In fact, my life is not even worth knowing your love. This sounds a lot like the Apostle Paul in Philippians, does it not? For to me, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. Right? He, he's, he says, I don't even know which is better. Is it better for me to stay and be with you? Or is it better for me to go and be with God? For to me, to live is Christ. To die is gain. He says, you're, Paul's saying, your love is better than life. In the midst of our trial, in the midst of our storm, in the wilderness, when our, whole, or when our soul is thirsty and craving, it's right for us to praise God, to thank Him. Now, that's counterintuitive, right? And Job's wife said what? Curse God and die. Job says what? Naked I came into this world, naked I shall return. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Here the psalmist says what? My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. Why? 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 He says, my soul, verse 5, will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. Thank God. Satisfy yourself in God. Isn't this a credible picture? Nothing has changed. He says, my my, my soul and my flesh, they thirst, they long for you. And he says, now, my soul will be satisfied. What's he saying here? Oh, God, you are my God, and you are enough. You're enough. All I have is Christ. What more do we need? Satisfy yourself in God. I don't know about you, but when I look at Christians, I think we were some of the most dissatisfied people. Shame on us. We have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in the heavenly places. He has given us all that we need, and he is more than enough. C.S. Lewis said this, He who has God and everything else has no more than he who has God only. You catch that? He who has God in everything else has no more than he who has God only. <laughs> Sam Storms writes this, just turn it around. Everything without God is pathetically inferior to God without everything. <laughs> everything without God, pathetically inferior to God without everything. What shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own? So, satisfy yourself in God. How do you do this? We don't have a lot of time, so let's look at it together. That thirst for God is quenched as you, we see in verses 6 and 7, as you think about God. He says, when I remember you upon my bed, meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. This is not the first time David's been in the wilderness. What's he doing? He's remembering, right? I remember you upon my bed. <laughs> His bed right now is probably a you know, piece of ground, maybe a cave. And he says, I remember, God, how you have been my help, my protection. Right? So we, we think much about God in our time of need. We think about who he is. We think about his power. We think about his person. We think about his promises, right? David here in this moment, he is just resting in the faithfulness of God in the past. Well, that's a really good exercise when your soul is dry and you are thirsty. It's just to go back and recount the faithfulness of God time and time again. Because he is, right? He is faithful even when we are not. Think much. Right? This battle takes place in the mind. Right? God, God wants our head, right? Love God with all your heart, yes, but all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. He wants everything. And so here, he wants our thoughts captivated. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Verse 8, he says, my soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. So think about God and stick, 
stick to God. Right? The language there is uh, the very same language we see back in Genesis chapter 2. You know, when, uh, verse 24, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife. Same word. Cling. Hold fast. Cleave. You know, that's the language here. And so David says, my soul cleaves to you, holds fast to you, clings to you. No matter what comes my way, God, I will not leave you. I will hold tightly to you. See, God wants both our head and our heart. <laughs> and, and both are necessary if we're going to quench our thirsty souls. How do we come to this place where we thank God and we're satisfied in Him? Think much of Him, but be determined. Again, the language there, man, I want to I dig deeper into this and I don't have time. This, this imagery of a husband and wife clinging to one another, cleaving to one another, this is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with his people. That loving, passionate relationship. There's no room for coldness. Now, there are times in your, in your marriage, right, in your relationship with the one you love where things are hard, seasons are hard, and in those moments you cleave and you cling. But there are other times where it's not hard at all, right? There's, it's just... There's, there's passion, and there is love, and there is satisfaction in the one. And, and this is the kind of relationship that God wants to have with us as his people. Read Song of Solomon. <laughs> yes, it's a picture of marriage, but it's a picture of a relationship between the bride and the church. This is the kind of relationship God wants with us. And the last thing we see here in verses 9 through 11 he says, but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down to the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals, but the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. The last thing we do so we can come out thanking him, satisfied in God, is we swear by him. Right? That's the language here. What does that mean? It means that we, we make our pledge. We keep our covenant with God. We trust him. And what David is doing in this moment is he is trusting God for the future. Do you see it? He's in the wilderness, but he says what? I see victory on the horizon. <laughs> the king will. The king shall rejoice in God. Right? God, you're going to keep your promise. God made a promise to David, and David is clinging holding on tightly to that promise. God, you are my God, and I, I am your people. Right? This is the covenant language of God, the steadfast love of God that David is hanging on to. And in those wilderness experiences, this is where we run to. What shall separate me from the love of God? Short answer, nothing. Nothing shall separate me from the, God, the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. What I want you to see tonight is these wilderness experiences are actually a gift from God. And I know that's hard because those are they're trying times, they're difficult days. Your, your soul is parched. But it's in those wilderness experiences where what happens? We draw closer to the Lord. Where, where we experience Him in deeper ways. I, just like Job, right? I had heard of you, but now I see you. It's through those storms, those trials, those difficult days. Some of you are there right now. Some of you will be there in the future. And regardless of whether you're there or whether you will be there, Psalm 63 can be a great help to your heart. David is simply saying, God, I need more of you. More of you. And if you don't know this God, that's your greatest need tonight. You can know God through Jesus Christ, his son, who loved you, who died for you, so that your sin could be forgiven and you could experience life in Christ. I think that's true for many of you. If so, may you leave here seeking the Lord with all your heart. Let's, let's close in prayer.